Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. A hearty Mahakam welcome to you. What an honor. Even the arbalists salute us with cocked quarrels. Oh, that well. An ounce of prevention saves a slag heap of trouble. Isabel? Apologies. Thoughts consume me sometimes. Is there something you need? Since we left Edurn, you've seemed unsettled. Is all in order? I've seen many wars in my time. All ugly, all repulsive. But what the Imperials did at Aldersburg was... It was unforgivable. Nilfgaard. That's what it does, Isabel. They seek here to repeat the rape of Sintra. The slaughter there. Yes, I saw that. I was there. And at Sodden. Then you know of what they're capable? After Sodden, I took an oath never to take part in another war. Such suffering, such hatred, senseless, all those deaths. Senseless deaths? Our troops sacrificed their lives in defense of their homeland, loved ones. I believe, I must believe there's a better way. Forgive me, Mum. I must gather my thoughts. Never mind about me, though. I shall perform my duties to my utmost, as ever, as always. You speak with my soldiers a good deal, said so yourself. I'd like to know what about. Hmm. Corporal Larkin, ma'am. Do you know him? Captain Oisin, perhaps? Or Lieutenant Teagan? Of course I know them. Among my best, they've served me loyally for years. You know them. But did you know that in fleeing Lyria, the Corporal left behind a newborn daughter? His wife was in confinement when you gave the order to march. The Corporal could not go to see them. And true, the Captain has no wife, no child. But he's not seen his brother in five years. Never once been granted leave. Your General Odo's orders always taking precedence. Allow me to guess. You shall now tell me Tegan abandoned his sick mother to follow me. No, ma'am. Count Caldwell's men murdered the Lieutenant's kin. Retaliation for his joining your rebellion. He learned of this just recently. Enough. You've made your point. Yet even were I to order them to return, they wouldn't listen. They know they've got nothing to go home to while Nilfgaard occupies our land. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. Your Grace? Farewell, Ake. Yes, Your Grace. How go things, Reynard? You and Gascon get along now, I hope. Well, you might say we've established a certain rapport, Your Grace. Tell me more, friend. 
I don't pry into his affairs, nor he into mine. I'd prefer it if my commanders worked together more closely. Your Grace, the man's a brigand. Oh, Reynard, he was a brigand. I must disagree, I fear. Yes, he stopped thieving for now, but only because it's convenient, so to speak. Gascon isn't a changed man. He still hasn't an ounce of honor, dignity. Yet he has a unit of armed men, without which we'd be much worse off. Might not even have survived. Agreed. The Strays are excellent fighters. I'd be the first to admit it. I only fear they might turn on us. Leap at our throats when we least expect it. It's time I attended to other matters. Hey ho! How's my favorite queen in the north? You and Reynard, do you get along? Like a cat and a hound. <laughs> get it? Because they call me. Yes, yes, your jests are easily understood. Far more difficult to enjoy. That's probably true, in your royal high and mightiness's case. Will you answer my question? <sighs> we get along because we must. Though it'd be far easier if he pulled the lance from his ass. Haven't heard a truer word in a long while. What was that? Nothing. Nothing. It's time I attended to other matters. Farewell. Your Grace, I need to speak with your quartermaster. Hey, excuse my elvish, but I can't drink that goat's piss he serves in the mess. Ugh, Reynard's doing no doubt. He doesn't like the men to drink too much. To be blunt, ma'am. What Reynard himself needs is to get good and bluttered for once in his stiff life. So, I have a proposal for you. A shipment of the best dwarven mead and lager. I can arrange for you to arrive. Trust me, the men's morales nae like to be a problem when they pour a bit of fire in their guts. Hmm. Good point. Very well. Oh, give my thanks, dear Queen. A few more days of that, and I'd have been lapping up puddle water. I trust you'll arrange the details. Uh, of course. No worries. You dinna ken how happy a dwarf you've made me. Ah, right. And the men, too, of course. Your elder. I'd like to know more. Do tell me about him, please. Hmm. But one tough horsen, Bruva. Stubborn as an old goat. As you'll soon see for yourself. All in all, though, he's near as scary as some say. Been keeping the clans in check for some two centuries now. Which is near a small feat, I might add, no. No conflicts between them all this time. Are you certain? Ha! <laughs> ha! I, I can't tell if you're jesting. <laughs> At each other's throats each day they are. Breckenrigs despise the Chives. Dalbergs would scratch out the Hoog's eyes, given half the chance. As for us, we hate them arse-licking fooses. But Bruver's got his ways, keeps each yen in line. If not for him, Mahakam would have fallen to bits ages past. Why? Round 150 years ago. When the Elves were fighting that hopeless war against your folk, the Elder-in-Chief ordered the pass to Mahakam sealed tight. If it weren't for that, we'd have ended up like the pointy ears. As it was, we waited for the shite storm to abate. Didn't they open the pass and stretch your legs again till it were safe? Yes, I remember. The manufacturers in Rivia have yet to recover. With all due respect, Your Grace, your workshops forge utter crap. It's not your fault that human folk prefer dwarven goods. Basic market principles, that's all it is. I feel enlightened, Gabor. Thank you. You're a Zigrin, are you not? I know the name. One of your clan slew the dragon Ockfist. Aye. You're thinking of Yarpen. Cousin of my cousin. Left my hackam when I was but a wee snot. Decent enough dwarf but never could conform to our basic tenets and laws. Though, admittedly, we've so damn many it's hard to keep them from leaking out your ears. Is it that bad? Hmm. 
I'll put it this way. Among human folk, you can't steal, brawl, murder. All the basics. In Mahakam, we've got laws about how to braid our beards. But I'm no one to complain. The Zilgrins are well-to-do, one of the richer clans. Got more than enough goods to suit our needs. Though, we've got some bads as well. What do you mean? Bah! Nay no worth your time. I didn't mean to bother you. Sides, best to jabber of such things over a cold pint. Or keg? We shall return to this conversation later. No skin off, ma'am. Yes, my lady. You choose not to follow your king, Xavier. Why? To fight in the field, with you. This was my wish, my lady. But what of your home? Rosberg must be rebuilt. Engineers are needed. I have no kin in Rosberg. No soul left for me there. All I've left is revenge. I understand. Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. Yes? Demoven's reason for so fiercely defending Aldersburg, I must say it caught me quite by surprise. Not me. King went to that brothel every time we stopped at Aldersburg, which was oft. He made sure of that. I told him he'd sting a girl with his serpent one day, but he wouldn't listen. My, I see Demoven couldn't keep anything secret from you. Didn't have a choice, really. When Edurn was not at war, I served as his bodyguard. Followed him everywhere and saw everything. My king enjoys life, enjoys pleasures and indulges often. But none of this has hindered his ability to govern the realm bloody well. Rayla, might I ask you a personal question? Certainly, ma'am. But I can't guarantee I'll answer. You see, Nilfgaard marched into my land, invaded, stole my crown, slaughtered my folk, and topped it all off by turning my own son against me. Yet, the hatred I hold for them is a mere shadow of the passion that grips you. You lust for the blood of every last Scoyatel. Haven't heard a question yet, Your Grace. What did they do to you, Rayla? What happened to make you who you are? Elves and humans, they can interbreed, but you must know that. My mother was an elf, making me half of one. We lived in a hamlet, and all around us knew. The other children had bullied me, beat me, spit in my face. You know why? Because they feared the Squiatel. But powerless, fully aware they could not defend themselves, they took their fear and shame out on me. The Scoyatel saw a hatred and terror between the races. And that will not change. It will not disappear. As long as their bloody rebellion continues. I must go. We'll speak later. None too shabby as views go, eh? Mmm, were it not for the howling wind, I'd make a sketch. Meave rode slowly, her surroundings interesting to her, her ears keen to take in the cacophony of sounds, the sharp whistle of wind rushing past towering peaks, the squeak of wagon wheels rolling over frozen snow. 
and the roar of beasts. What the? I dare not venture a guess. Hmm. Gabo scratched his chin. An ice troll. Or one of them barbegazar bejabbers. These beasts, are they tame? As the dragon? <laughs> not in your life. Fierce horsons, every last one of them. Spring cleaning year past, one year bet my arm clear off. The Queen's brow rose in a silent inquiry. All oh, right. You don't quite ken the context. Each spring, with the melting of the snows, a good bit of that filth comes out the ground. That's when Bruver Hoog summons all dwarves for spring cleaning. We cut down as much of the filth as we can, and that means relative calm the rest of the year. Out of the corner of her eye, Meave noted a dark shape darting between rock formations. Calmly, she drew her sword and brandished it a time or two to warm up her stiff arms. Seems it is our lot to assist you with this cleaning. Lyrians, arms at the ready. Prepare to fight. As the wails of speared Shalemars died down, the crowd of Mahakaman infantry parted. A dwarf stepped forth, grey as a snow fox, wrinkled as a prune. He walked with difficulty, supporting himself on a battle axe, its two heads dripping blood. This would be our elder in chief, Bruver Hoog. And who might your guests be, Gabor? Meave. Queen of Lyria and Rivia, and her associates in court. My regards, Elder. I come... You come for something. Coins my first wager. Fighting bodies my second. Well, what is it you want? I'm on in the years, I, but I'm not gone dotty. Tja, you menfolk. You got to fall on hard times to remember us dwarves. I've come with a design in mind, I cannot deny. But hear me out, and you shall see. She's armed! Gabor! Why the devil did you let her in here like that? Armed without a sack or a heat! She has the leaden ring, Elder. A gift from a king. From Demavand, lassie, I came that already. Trust a man, give him something of value, and he'll go and give it away as easy as a street whore gives away nubs. It's a good thing he didn't pawn it. Sons of humans. I've travelled far to see you. Hear me out, I beg you. Yeah, let it be my loss. Go on, haver away. Nilfgaard has overrun my realms. It has overrun Edurn. The Blackclads are at the foot of Mahakam. They will seek to overrun your land sooner or later as well. We must act. We must react together, while there is still time. Time? What do you care a time, lass? Got how many summers to you? Forty, maybe? Had you grown up amongst dwarven folk, at your age you'd be learning to crochet dolls. No more than that. I've seen four hundred summers come and go. And I've been elder for two hundred. And you know what I've learned in that time? That meddling in your idiot scraps doesn't ever bring any good. Now, on a normal day, I'd have you all thrown clear out of this land I love. But you've the leaden ring, and that grants you the right to hospitality. And here, in Mahakam, laws and rights are sacred. You may stay in the pass as long as you wish. Young Zigrin will serve as your guide. And once you've tired of the mountains, well, you can the way down into the valleys. I bid you farewell. My lord Elder, with all due respect, we came to your aid. We smote the beasts with you, yet... And who the demons is this son? Count Reynard Odo. Ho <laughs> ho, Odo, Lodo, Bodo! <laughs> now, you listen and listen well. We didn't ask for aid, and you know why? Cause I've my dignity. Not like some. Mates and wenches! Spring cleaning's done, beast cullen's over. Mount Carbon beckons us home. Follow me. Your Grace, be not dismayed. We will find a way. Manage we shall, true. Though damned if I know how. 
We have none other to whom we can turn, no other land where we can flee. Let us convene in council, Your Grace. Consider together what's to be done. We've yet Redania, Temeria. Your Grace, might I draw you aside a wee moment for a jabber? Reynard, please excuse me. Well, what is it you want? I ken the Elder in Chief didn't make a good first impression. <laughs> and the second? Is it any better? Mm, to be quite frank, no. I'll try elsewise. Not all's lost, trust me. Brewer's a stubborn goat, no doubt about it. But a goat to be persuaded. And I happen to ken how. The selfless impulse to help? I don't believe it exists. So before you describe how you aim to aid me, be kind enough to explain why you wish to do so. Unsolicited, mind you, and clearly against your elders' wishes. A query of my own to answer yours. Do you ken when Brewerhoog last strode down the mountains into your lowlands? I know not. While King Sambuk sat on the throne? Point of fact, never. Hoog was born here and he'll die here, like most Mahakaman dwarves. Whereas I'm a frequent visitor in your human lands. Been an emissary to royal courts, trade guilds, mummers, troops, and I've eyes. I can see all the rubbish goes on between yous. Nilfgaard's insatiable. The black clads will not stop till they've put the whole continent neath their boot. From Ophir in the south to the Dragon Mountains in the north. Gods forbid they grip all the Nordlings' realms in their vice. Cause then we'll have their hordes all round. Controlling all the trade routes, supply lines, diversions even. And then they'll control terms and prices. <sighs> we dwarves have never been on elite, let alone a short one. So, in short, we'll all be better off with the black clads back across the Yaruga. And I've seen your grace. Seen you in battle. You've brawn and bite, and with the right support, you can drive them back. I ken that well. Very well, I'm all ears. What must we do to spur Bruverhoog to aid us? Hmm. I might start with the thorn in our side that are beasts. A bigger thorn than most expect. See, in our never-ending search for gold, we dug deep too deep, and reached abysses where monsters are born, or however they come to be. Soon as it turns a bit warmer, they crawl out to feed, and there's more every year. What you saw there, the spring cleaning, that's just light yearly upkeep. It did not go at the source of the blight. Every spring we cull enough so we can live and trade and mine normal-like, but there are corridors in the upper valleys midst the peaks where more lie waiting to pounce. So many, there are settlements that have done been abandoned. I still fail to see how this relates to myself and Bruva. Your Majesty, slay the beasts down to their last, and you'll win the hearts of the clans. All of them. And with the clans behind you, why? The Elder will have no choice. He'll bend an ear, treat you serious. You got two sites through which beasts swarm in great numbers. There's Daver's Abyss and an abandoned underground settlement called Burra's Rump. Destroy those, collapse the corridors, problem solved. Hmm. You colour the solution as simple and known. Why has Bruva Hoog not gone at the matter? Ha! <laughs> you must learn one thing about us dwarves of Mahakum. Customs. Traditions, why, we're obsessed. Goes thrice for Bruva. The Elder deliberates weeks on end. And that's in considering if we shouldn't wear suspenders, cause they might be through its side and should thus be forbidden. We've a set of laws, the Four Dwarves Codex. One of its tenants says, dare ye not close a corridor once oped. So, no self-respecting dwarf can nor will do it. But you, you're free out with. The laws didn't apply. 
You have a free hand in sealing the corridors from which the beasts come. Collapse them. Flood them, I dinna ken. But solve the grief once and for all. And this, t'would suffice? I believe it would. Uh, but, but, but find you other ways to win the heart of a clan or Bruver itself. Do so. Can he bring no harm? Hmm. All this sounds rather toilsome, yet... I do favour this to losing another moon seeking out a court where we would at first be welcomed, only later to hear another rebuke. You've my gratitude, Gabor. You've shown me a way. Very well. Let us think on these beasts. See what's to be done. I've come to the conclusion your Elder-in-Chief is not fond of guests. Fond? That's near the quarter of it. He hates them with seething passion. But you're damned lucky. Why's that? Legend, didn't he? Mahakam was cordoned off completely through the outside world for many a long year. Clans finally forced Bruva to at least let in peddlers and emissaries. <laughs> Though he dragged his feet as long as he could. Quiet, wench. Oh, you'll scare the fish off. Crevens, Trout was already nipping at the bait. And you came along and frightened it off. Duval shice! Duval shice! Dwarves are demanding a pretty sum. No offense. They're out. No offense. The dwarves are demanding a pretty sum, but their steel's worthy of any crown. Okay now, at this spot, Rayla will do something bad. So, I'm gonna have to save. Meave noted a crowd of dwarves. They were several dozen, many holding baskets brimming with dried sausages, soft, puffy pretzels and jugs of frothy beer. What is this gathering? She asked Gabor. These folk? They're the parents of youngsters who are to return today from their Drek'thai. 
Gabor proceeded to explain that the Drekthag was a trek upon which the local dwarves would embark when they reached maturity. During this year-long voyage, young folk would taste of life beyond their home. Yet if they failed to return on time, they would be stripped of all rights and privileges accorded to Mahakam's natives. See, in recent years, young folk's blood's been boiling on account of the strict laws in force here. Gabor added. So, we send them out. Let them taste life in the lowlands. Once they've learned for themselves what it's like to live among humans, they come back and ain't likely to complain. Customarily, only a few dwarves ever decided to remain in the valleys for good. That year, however, was different. Deadline's the Mora. And 40 Drekthagers still have not returned. Their parents now worried if some misfortune had not befallen them. The Mahakaman Guard had sent out patrols to the near reaches of the valleys. They returned not having seen anything distressing, while the humans living at the foot of the massif had been largely unwilling to talk. The guard captain, a dwarf with a fiery red beard, removed his helmet, wiped the sweat from his brow, and addressed Meave. Your Majesty, we need to find our youth. Perhaps you'd be willing to go out and search. Human folk are more like to tell you if they saw anything out of the ordinary of late. Naturally, there'd be something in it for you too. One could say I myself have lost a son. Meave gripped the captain's hand firmly. And I know well the pain that comes. I shall do all in my might to spare you at least that. Meave set off, the hopeful gazes of the dwarven parents bidding her farewell. The queen sent a scout ahead. Sometime later, she heard his horn. Three blasts, two short, one long. An ambush! Meave expected to combat beasts or robbers. Yet upon her force descended warriors with squirrel tails attached to their helms. Scoyatel. As soon as the battle had come to an end, the prisoners were brought before the queen. All, without exception, were dwarves. And all looked to be youthful dwarves. Mystery solved, muttered Meave. In fact, these were the missing Drekthagas. Instead of returning home, they had enlisted with guerrillas fighting for non-human rights. But what had prompted so drastic a decision? I was impatient. Wanted badly to turn 50. I couldn't wait to see human cities. Vitsima, Tretigor, Novigrad, said one of the dwarven prisoners while pressing a bandage to a bleeding wound. And you know the welcome that awaited me there? I was spit upon and called names. I saw ghettos, massacres, and how was I to go back to the mines after that? We must fight while we still can. Before the humans come to cut us down, we must tell the rest of ours the same. Pull all Maha come into the fight! Meave's soldiers stood waiting for her to protest, to accuse the dwarf of lying. But the queen could not pretend she did not understand why the dwarf had taken up arms. Without entering into a discussion, she ordered the prisoners taken to be tried and judged by their kin and elders. Along her way, Meave heard cries. She rushed to see what the ruckus was about. Upon seeing Black Rayler spattered with blood, she expected the worst. Raynard could only confirm the Queen's fears. She entered the wagon unnoticed, the wagon carrying the prisoners. She then cut their throats, one by one. Forty dwarves. Alone. They were shackled. They could not defend themselves. Rayla had nothing to say in her defense. In point of fact, she exuded pride. Mahakam had been free of Scoyatel, till now. We'd have done all a questionable favor by bringing back a wagon full of enraged youth wearing squirrel tails. They'd have posed as martyrs for a just cause. They'd have shown off their scars and persuaded the clans to make war on humans. All that deserved to be nipped in the bud. Meave could see the blood rushing to Raynard's head. When he finally spoke, it was clear he was holding the reins of his emotions, preventing himself from exploding with some difficulty. Your Grace, we must banish her, drive her off. This was in no way ordinary insubordination. This was a grave crime. Your Majesty, you know I rarely meddle in your affairs, said Isbo. Yet for this, I cannot remain silent. This woman must go. 
Rayla, it is a fine line that separates a soldier, a warrior, from one who commits murder, said Meave. That line you crossed today. You are to leave my ranks immediately, and never do I wish to see you again. Rayla said nothing. She merely bowed in an excessively courtly manner, then moved off down the slope. Yet even once she disappeared, a clear red trail remained in the snow where she had passed. A trail of dwarven blood that had dripped from her armor. The Lyrians remained silent throughout their return. Upon spying their downcast eyes and somber means, the dwarves awaiting the return of their offspring dispersed to their homes, leaving baskets full of treats in the snow. No one asked any questions of Meave. Luckily so, as the Queen would not have known how to answer. Didn't he find nothing? Not a trace. What could have happened? Didn't he find nothing? Didn't he find didn't he find nothing? Didn't he find nothing? Didn't he find nothing? Didn't he find nothing? Not a I neither accept nor condone what Rayla did. Yet, there is a war on, and she is one of the best warriors I have under my command, said the Queen. Naturally, I shall punish her, but I cannot banish her. Reynard opened his mouth to say something, but upon spotting Rayla's scornful smile, he turned on his heel and marched off without a word. He was later seen in the mess tent, drinking alone, his eyes fixed on the bottom of his tankard. The Lyrians remained silent throughout their return. Upon spying their downcast eyes and somber means, the dwarves awaiting the return of their offspring dispersed to their homes, leaving baskets full of treats in the snow. No one asked any questions of Meave. Luckily so, as the Queen would not have known how to answer. Mom, I've come to tell you I must leave your army. What? Why? Against my better judgment, I joined you to heal your wounded. I realize now that was a mistake. What exactly do you mean? What you did runs counter to all my beliefs. You had your reasons, and have them still, I know. Yet I've no desire to abet them. I'd feel shame to lend a hand. What can I do? Is there anything that would make you stay? No, ma'am. Farewell. So be it. Good luck and Godspeed, Isabel. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip this quest. Queen noted a building with unusually lavish ornamentation, including shining bronze roof tiles and glistening rock crystal window panes. An important clan dwelled there, Gabor explained. The Breckenrigs. Could you introduce me? Meave asked. Perhaps I can convince them to intercede with Bruver on my behalf. The clan head, Ivor, invited Meave to an exquisite feast. But when she broached the subject of the war raging just outside Mahakam's borders, the dwarf changed the subject at once. 
Looking around the interior, Meave quickly understood why. The walls were ordained with Nilfgaardian tapestries and rugs. Gifts from friendly Imperial envoys, no doubt. Meave prepared to leave, convinced she had wasted her time, when someone clasped her shoulder and pulled her into a darkened room. Her kidnapper turned out to be a young dwarf, female, it seemed, dressed in her nightshirt. She introduced herself as Ivor's daughter, Eudora Breckenridge, and openly admitted she had eavesdropped on Meave's dinner conversation. Listen, me dad's stubborner than an old goat, but I'll convince him to help you, for a wee favour, that is. Mm-hmm. What? I want you to steal something from the clan archive. Historiae Mahakamorum, tis called. See, me dad won't let me betroth me sweetikin Zoltan. Says the Codex forbids marrying a dwarf who's left the mountains. But there's precedent. Just such a case described in that document. If I can show it to Da, he'll have to change his mind. Me felt sympathy for Eudora and wanted to help her, especially considering the favor Eudora could do her in return. But she fully realized if her attempt to break into the archive ended badly, it would result in a tremendous scandal Bruva Hoog would not soon forget. Hmm. The pot's worth the play, I believe. Fine. I accept your offer. They then shook hands, sealing the deal. Meave had to bite her tongue to stop from crying out, for the young she-dwarf had the grip of a brawny blacksmith. Meave returned to her company and, massaging her sore hand, presented Eudora's offer. Gascon volunteered for the task at once. Thievery's my forte. The dwarves won't notice a single mothball out of place. Gascon snuck into the archive under the cover of darkness. Just as he was tucking Eudora's desired document into his cloak, he heard dwarven boots clanking down the stairs. Damn it! Gascon swore. I can't let them catch me. Luckily, Gascon managed to do the deed quietly, so the dwarves never found out who had broken in. As agreed, Meave handed Eudora the stolen document. Ha! The dwarf shouted, raising the parchment in a triumphant gesture. Da, can he do nothing if stop our making vows now? <laughs> I've got to write Zoltan right quick. Thanks. Thanks a million times over. And Eudora did her part too. Soon after, the Queen learned there'd been a gathering of the clans, and Ivor had indeed spoken on her behalf. She could only hope the elder Breckenrigs had swayed Bruva Hoog as well. Eudora Breckenrigs Chuve. <laughs> oh, I truly like the sound of that. Oh, oh there's nothing like solidarity to da stubborn. But I always find a way with him in the end. The right strat da stubborn. But I always find a way with him in the end. The right strategy. You can count on us, Queenie. Ivor'll be a wall at your back. Stout and strong. <laughs> what are you poking me for? Ah, scrounging for coin, no doubt. Righty then, take this pouch and kindly get off my arse. I told you to hold your horses or you'll shake the hitch loose. Oh, now you're a bleeding expert, are you? You overloaded the damn cart, that's why it's busted. A wagon lay strewn across the middle of the road. Behind it stood others, some loaded with gold, jewels and other valuables, others groaning under barrels of pickled meat. Each dwarf had his own theory about how the accident had come about and thundered it out to all and sundry, peppered with choice invectives. An odd caravan, Meave said. They don't look like merchants. Nay, they ain't, Gabor answered. Dwarves of the Ferens clan, carrying gifts for the Drake. Remember Keltilus? When he took Roost here, Ferences fought him for near a century. Then the dragon got weary of fighting, and they realized he weren't going nowheres, so they cut a deal. He didn't bother them. They give him what he needs. Well, well. And these offerings they send often? Every week. Excuse me, got to separate them lads, or they tear out each other's beards. Hey there! Cool your idiot heads! Gabor managed to douse his brethren's fiery tempers. 
that the wagon still lay across the road, blocking all traffic. Queen? said Xavier. It is an easy repair. I have the tools, the parts. Need but your permission. Of course. Go see what can be done. Xavier did indeed make quick work of the problem. Within moments, the wagon was rolling smoothly down the road, good as new. Well, shaft me, your highness, said one of the dwarves. Your engineer's got a paint like stewed meat, but he kens his trade, that's for certain. I'll convey your words to him, or at least part of them. Uh, me and the lads will be on our way now, but, but first, take this. Bit of gold by way of thanks. I appreciate the offer, but I cannot accept coin for helping a traveller in need. Common decency it is. Huh? In our times, decency ain't common at all, but as you wish. Farewell. The dwarf bowed in parting, shook the snow off his beard, then rejoined his caravan. Within a few moments, the wagons had disappeared around the bend. A pillar of smoke rose above the mountains, and a sooty aroma filled the air. Fire, Gabor said, then took a deep sniff. Perhaps a bolt struck some barren trees? No, Meave said curtly. I know that scent too well. All Edurn reeked of it. It's the smell of burning homes. The Lyrians quickened their gait. Soon they saw a town fully aflame and a roaring, furious dragon above it. That's your Keltalus? Gascon asked, shielding his eyes from the sharp glare emanating from the city. You were right. Perfectly harmless. Then the king was get his knickers in a bunch, the dwarf said, grabbing his axe from his belt. Queen, we got to make haste to the rescue. Smother your fears, sir dwarf, Ake proclaimed. Without waiting for me's reply, he dropped his lance and galloped headlong towards the burning city. Follow me! Slay the Viper! Reynard! Meave called out. Have our men wet their cloaks for a modicum of fire protection. We move as soon as they're done. If we don't make haste, Ake will be reduced to smouldering plate. Your Grace, they are but common soldiers. To fight a dragon... I know. But we must help them, or at least try. While Reynard went to pass on the order, Meave turned to Gabor. This dragon... Has it any weakness? Fear not, said the somber dwarf. Except a fondness for raw meat. Meave nodded and swallowed dryly. Despite the cold, she felt sweat pour down her scalp. Stifling her fear, Meave gave the order to attack, and her soldiers rode into the flaming city. From up close, Keltalis looked even more terrified. Though enormous, he moved with shocking agility, like a lizard scurrying over sand. With one swing of his paw, he snapped the necks of three dwarves, then bisected a four with a powerful bite. After that, he turned his attention to the Lyrians. More of you! He said, twisting his bloody maw into a horrifying smile. God! That day, many Lyrians perished either to the dragon's all-consuming fire, or to its flesh-rending claws. Yet their sacrifice was not in vain. Together with the dwarves, they were able to grievously wound Keltalis, forcing him to flee. The howls of the wounded monster rang throughout the valley. That's right, howl, you scurvy snake! Shouldn't he ever attacked us, eh? Damn fuel wizard! Meave, that's Vavranik. Elder of the town and all the Ferences. My regards and condolences. Eh, tain't so bad. If nay for ye, wouldn't there be a stone left unrubbled? 
To be honest, when I caught when some human queen come to Mahakam looking for aid, I said a crocus would sprout twixt my cheeks afore I'd vote aye on that. Gonna be a fear to look in my breeches after, but changed my mind. After what I saw today, what ye did for us, ye have to support an undying gratitude of all Ferences. Thank you. Faced with the Nilfgaardian peril, that means a great deal. Uh, forgive me for interrupting this tear-tugging scene of interracial reconciliation, but I can't hold back any longer. Favrenek! Double chase! What happened? Why Kilkless attack? I can as much as ye. Meaning, squat diddly. Just flew up, started spewing flames, half the tune lit up in a flash. Sheepshank! Three hundred years I've been a good neighbour. What's done's done. Got to think about the future. The Drake's just taking a breather. Got to finish him off for his regained form. Meaning we have not much time. He heals like an alchemist's pup. And the nearest guards are miles away. He'll be up flying again before they get here. Aye, that's what I thought. Ahem. <clears throat> Perhaps your grace, you'd... Uh... What? Jest you must. I ken you're tired through the fight, didn't want to risk casualties, etc. But remember, the beast sleeping on a bed of gold and rubies. All belonging by right to Bruder, of course. But if a uh, quibbling son wandered off, he'd na notice. I admit that does alter my calculations. Besides, the dragon was badly wounded. Putting it feathery, blood poured out of him like a leaky bladder. Just needs a coup de gras. Fine. I'll do the deed. Can you see the light? Oi, Vavranek, Vavranek. This lady's gonna make your rump a regular crocus garden. Aye. Queen's doing us a great service. One that'll profit us both. So, where is Keltalus's lair? North of here. It's a vast cavern. Ye canna miss it. Meave bid farewell to Vavrenek and set out on her way. Did her way lead to the dragon's lair, you ask? Shh. Let's not spoil the surprise. Keltalis' lair was indeed impossible to miss, as would stand to reason, for any space capable of containing a dragon must be enormous. The lair's moor, a black triangle cut out of a vast plain of snow, loomed from afar. Confirming the dragon's presence was the powerful odor emanating from it, one of sulfur and blood. Well then, Gascon said, ready to become a legendary dragon slayer? My father oft said, never should you count pelts till the hunt is through. Meave said, dismounting her horse. It's all the more true when you hunt dragons. He's wounded, yes, but one puff of flame, and we shall be not legends, but corpses. Leave all thoughts of foolhardy bravery behind. The Lyrians crept across the dragon's threshold. They walked single file, shields raised, watched by bats hanging from the ceiling. Keltalus lay curled up on a bed of diamonds and gold coins turned red from his blood. Seeing how he strained merely to lift his massive head, Meave knew the dragon no longer posed any threat. Come to finish what your poison began? <sighs> the monster croaked hoarsely. Fine. Do it then. Keltalis turned over, exposing his vulnerable underbelly, and waited calmly for the fatal blow. Meave raised her sword high and swept it down with enormous strength, cutting the scaled belly in twain. The monster bellowed out a long roar and writhed its tail, scattering diamonds everywhere. Then grew still. Keltalis, the last red dragon between the Great Sea and the Fiery Mountains, had breathed his last.
There followed a strange silence. No one cheered. No one clapped. Only Ake whispered a prayer of thanks under his breath. That was... Gascon said, the first to break the silence. Not terribly epic. What'd you expect? Gabor said, arms akimbo. Fanfare and fireworks? The mountain to quake? He up and died. What else would he do? I am certain, Your Grace, Reynard said, that the poets will endow this moment with the appropriate splendor. I'm sure they will, the Queen said, sheathing her sword. For they are liars. The Queen told her soldiers to gather a part of the dragon's treasure. Small enough not to bring down the wrath of Bruva Hoog, but large enough to fully compensate the Lyrian's losses. And Meave gained the title of Dragon Slayer, though she rarely made much mention of it. Trust a Borheed and what do you get? A singed bahuki? Brown, 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 red, gold. Every dragon's a right bastard. Meave squinted, the better to see the scene. Several dozen dwarves had gathered on the cliff overlooking the chasm. All were turned towards a ramp, at the peak of which stood a barrel. What is that gathering about? asked the queen. Have we a feast day? Nay, answered Gabor grimly. It is an execution. A hairy head peeked out of the barrel. The long, pointy nose and ears left no doubt that it belonged to a gnome the first Meave had ever seen in her life. Help! Save me! The gnome yelled. They aim to kill me! Cast me in the chasm! Shut your maw! Barked the dwarf standing next to him, who then shoved the gnome inside the barrel and covered it with a lid. Your crimes! The sheer weight of him, hey! No lighter punishment is fit! The other gathered dwarves nodded approvingly. Two gripped the barrel, lay it on its side, then lifted it to cast in the chasm, paying the thumping from inside it no heed. Meave leapt from her horse and, ignoring Gabor's objections, scrambled up the ramp. Oi! You're not allowed! Hey, damn it! What do you think you're doing? I think it's obvious. Preventing the execution. Oh! Oh! Thanks be to the gods! Whoa, wench, you have no such right. Judgment's been handed down. Sentencing's done. Yes, and a cruel sentence it is. One that prompts me to wonder what the accused did to deserve it. Ha <laughs> ha! Better to ask what he didn't he do, the varmint. Arrived here with his peddler's wagon full of tricks and gadgets. Went from house to house. Praise his rubbish to the high heavens, and what's it he sold us? Bombs that go off in your hand. Beard growth formula that makes your hair catch fire. Music boxes for the kiddies. Once cranked, they never plow in stop. You needed but to loosen the screw in the back and... Shut your maw, ye roaster. Doesn't it matter all that? Because we'd have forgiven it if he hadn't broken our sacred rules and hallowed customs. 
Which ones? If you don't mind me asking. <coughs> Enter the smithy. Cap on his head. Held nails between his teeth. And poured fruit syrup in his beer. Raspberry. Pleh. Just the ones? And but a few drops. You got nothing to explain your villainy, scoundrel. Not a thing. And that's not even the worst. Saved his highest crime for the end. He was in a mine. And he whistled. Ooh. Oh, aye, that's bad. Shouldn't have done that. Hi, he did. Whistled through his teeth and hummed in harmony a, a long warble. We all heard it up and down the shaft, and our grand elders were clear. Death's the punishment. Death by barrel roll. Wait one minute. What exactly does the Four Dwarves Codex say? Which stricture did he violate? What did... How, how did... How's it a witch and a, a human one to boot? Know about the code. This human wench has a head and a capacious one. Well, have you an answer? <clears throat> the code says thus. Tis a crime most grievous to whistle in a mine. Any dwarf committing the cock-up shall be placed in a barrel at once. Said barrel then to be rolled down a mountain. Any dwarf. The situation's clear. If my senses do not deceive, the accused is a gnome. <clears throat> Nothing to be divined here. You got to be a dwarf to be a dwarf, not no bloody gnome. So, am I, um, meaning I'm free to go? Hmm. Uh, perchance we ought to let the Elder in Chief rule on the matter. Oh, aye. Oh, for we all ken how old Hoog loves being bothered with such things. Ugh, fine. Now get the hell out of that barrel and out of my sight, you hairy hamshanker. My lady, I haven't a way to thank you. That we've yet to discuss. Perhaps first we should learn each other's names? Um, hi, yes, uh, of course, oh, what the prat of me, uh, Barnabas, uh, Barnabas Beckenbauer, uh, to friends, Bibi. Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. A co queen? Cows in the corn, call me on it. Uh, your Majesty, obeisance due. None necessary. Protocols for use at court, not beyond it. An inventor you deem yourself, am I right? Most assuredly. Though, truth be told, the dwarves saw no ingenuity in my craft. <laughs> Seems I'm ahead of my time. Fiery bursts in the palm of your hand. They shall be in fashion one day, to your mind. Oh, nay! Nay, just a bit of misfortune, that's all that was. Y you see, I mistook mercury fulminate for saltpeter. The vials stood beside each other, see, and... The details I need not know. But one matter I am curious about. Could you construct a bomb that would explode when desired? For instance, beneath my foe's feet as they stepped over it? Well, of course I can! It's a simple. Why then? You wish to show your gratitude? You must join my ranks. Assist me to defeat Nilfgaard. D defeat Nilfgaard? <sighs> Your ambition, that is. But I'd have been a barrel of broken bones at the bottom of a ravine, if not for you. I'll do what you ask to pay off my debt. And thus, for the first time in Lyrian annals, a gnome enlisted with the army. And though Barnabas Beckenbauer was diminutive of body, this new recruit would prove his worth on more than one occasion. Well, a damn shame. What with such good visibility today, too? You change your mind last, let me know, eh? Got the barrel ready and waiting. Your Majesty, allow me once again to express my undying gratitude. 
You're most welcome, Barnabas, but please, we haven't need for any formalities when speaking alone. I, uh... Well, well of course. How might I help you, then? At the moment, have you any invention you've worked on? One that's near complete? Oh, so kind. Oh, wonderful, you should ask. See, I've, uh, I've ever had an avian fascination. Uh, for birds, you see. Their wings, bones. The structure's perfect. The aerodynamicism, the, the, the plumage. In short, I believe I can fly. I beg your pardon? Yes. Yes, I, I'm learning to fly. 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 You've not misheard. I, Barnabas Beckenbauer, will be the first norm... Oh, what am I saying? The first mammal to free himself of the soil's bondage and soar to the clouds. Hmm. But aren't bats also... A detail. This is no time to be petty. No, but frankly, my preparations are far advanced, and I'm rather optimistic about my design and prospects. I've calculated every trajectory, every force. It all works out. Just need to do a few more field tests. Did you have volunteers try it, or did you test the design yourself? Naturally, I must stay on the ground who take all the measurements elsewise. Uh, luckily, there's no lack of thrill-seekers in Mahakam. Most eager to etch themselves into the annals. My first prototype, the Sky Licker, I dubbed it. Oh, Your Majesty, if you'd only seen the beauty. Flew over a hundred and twenty L's. Truly? Colour me impressed indeed. Must have made quite the name for himself, your brave volunteer. I'm certain he's caught the eye of every she-dwarf in Mahakam since. Oh, no, he's dead. The landing, it was rough. And then a bear sauntered by, uh, didn't help any. Anyhow, as he died, the dwarf swore he regretted nothing. Brave lad. A bit daft, though. <clears throat> I see. But the next time you request I try one of your inventions, I'd ask you to remind me of this touching tale. I like to know. No, I must know who I travel with. Please do tell me about yourself. About me? <laughs> um, I've most civil relations with dwarves, <laughs> as you saw. Uh, but um, is there anything in particular you'd like to know? Why not start at the beginning? Tell me where you hail from, perhaps. Oh, right, right. Uh, well, uh, I was born in the distant south, in Tia Tokhair. My mother was a washerwife, my father an armourer. Soon as I'd passed forty winters and could strike out on my own, I left the family, my native parts. So I've been on the road now about, um, oh, twenty-odd years. Indeed, a rather long while. Did the south simply not suit you? Well, I wouldn't say that exactly. It's just staying would have meant stepping into my father's shoes. Then, forging blade after blade, plate after plate. Oh, just thinking on it sets my head a-spinning. Not for me, that, no. No, nature. The world so rich in mysteries, in wonders left to discover, and ways to make it a better place. By building bombs that explode in the hand, for instance. Ah, as those bearded fellas say, Mahakam wasn't built in a day. Besides, uh, nobody was seriously hurt by those malfunctions. Not many at any rate. Time I attended to other matters. Hmm? Ah, yes, you're still here. Off you go then. Yes? I must go. We'll speak later. Every year. 
hear more monsters crawling for the spring cleaning. Yeah. Remember, if you never, the whole, remember, if you pass a snail on them, the blizzard's blowing in. Your Grace, perhaps we'd best pitch camp and wait for clear weather. Tain't a bad idea. Said we might be waiting a week. Then we march on. We've no time to waste. While we ride to and fro begging aid, Nilfgaard grows in power. We must obtain reinforcements as quickly as possible and liberate our home. Meave rode on in silence, endeavoring to work out the length of her exile thus far. A scout's call tore her from her reverie. You're great! You must see this! With a grave mien, the soldier indicated a track in the snow. The hobnail bootprint was all too familiar. Meave had seen it before, upon Lyria's sandy tracks, and midst the ashes to which Edern had been turned. Nilfgaardian footmen. Seethed Meave. Marched through of late. Interrupted Gascon. A day, perhaps two days, passed. The scouts had learned a Nilfgaardian caravan with an armed escort had recently arrived in Mahka. The invaders had brought with them chests brimming with gold and jewels, then exchanged these for the finest Mahakaman forged swords and spears. A scout gave Meave one of the coins the Black Clads had used for payment. Upon the coin's back, the Lyrian eagle. They pay with gold from my vault, the queen said through gritted teeth. For arms that will cut down my fighting men and subjects. We might yet pursue and hunt them down, said Reynard, a spark in his eye. And make certain Ed Dahi never lays hands on those weapons. You might, again, piped up Gabor, who had been listening to their exchange. But you might also recall... We Mahakamans are neutrals who assure all guests within our borders safety. True, formally speaking, the Nilfgaardians have passed outside them, but attack them a stone's throw from our gates, and you'll see Bruver's rage come out his ears as steam and out his arse as fire. No war's outcome has been swayed by a few wagons of arms, no matter their quality, said the Queen, vaulting into her saddle. Yet if we turn Bruver against us, I dare say we shall never wrest our land from black-clad hands. The Queen's men regretted her reluctance to attack, but none tried to dissuade her. They knew her too well. We shan't pass this way. Oh, Rainer, whatever would we do without you? 
plummet off the cliff like lemmings, no doubt. Meave squinted and gazed off into the distance. It seemed to her that hundreds of black patches covered the peaks on the horizon. Once she had ridden up closer, she realized these were the windows of homes carved out of solid rock. Her pride this was, sighed Gabble. But as rump. A city carved out of mountain rock. Hundreds of miles of tunnels, dozens of steelworks, smithies and forges. Now, it's a vast lair to monsters. They ooze from underground, weave their nests, hatch their young, and when hunger hits them in the gut, they prowl down into the pass. Meave stood at the entrance to the underground city. The monumental gate, cast in bronze, lay on the ground, folded multiple times as a scroll of paper. Out of blackened windows oozed a stench of rotting meat and mold. The queen bent an ear to hear water dripping, and, in the distance, a metallic scraping. A sound akin to chitinous scales rubbing against rock. The soldiers await your order, your grace, said Reynard quietly, as if he feared he would wake the beasts asleep in the caverns. Do you recall my words as we fled Lyria? Said Neve, turning to Reynard. You swore you would retake your crown, even if you had to penetrate hell to do so. Time to follow that oath. The queen inhaled deeply and stepped forward, her sword raised and prepared to strike or parry. Moments later, it was swinging, biting, as the current tenants of Borrow's Rump came out to meet her. Though wounded, Meave approached the Sheomar, which lay writhing on the ground. She then ran her sword through its heart, finishing it. Yet so spent was she that she lacked the strength to pull her blade from between the plates of the chitinous armor. The beast near took me. She whispered. It was very close. The Lyrians reached a vast hall that had once served the clans as their meeting room. The stone benches were covered in sticky slime and insectoid eggs, while bats of varying size hung from the crystal chandeliers. Gascon rummaged through old, weathered bones, surely hoping to find something of value. Gabor, in turn, was at a shut and locked door, grappling with it as if it were a deadly beast. The door finally gave way with a sigh, and the dwarf raised his arms in a triumphant gesture. It's a storeroom. Should hold miners' tools aplenty, he said, enthused. Some barrels of alchemical brews in here, too. Lucky there's no sign of moisture. They haven't they soaked through. All's we've got to do is roll them out into the corridor set a bit of fire to them, and woof, we'll have sealed the beasts off from the pass once and for all. Meave treated the dwarves' instructions as hallowed. Soon after, the mountains trembled from a powerful explosion. Rubble came down and blocked the tunnels. They say the plumes of smoke escaping the window openings in the rock could be seen as far as Aldersburg. Dark clouds hovered over the horizon, and a strong gale snapped their banners. Damn it! A storm's coming! Gabor! Take us to the nearest settlement! We must seek shelter! Soon, the Lyrians arrived in Stoolcap. The town square proved full of folk. Several dozen dwarves, laden with large sacks and satchels, stood about in smaller groups. When a thick snow began to fall, the dwarves cheered. Tears streamed down the cheeks of several, but Meave could not tell if they issued from some fortuitous occurrence, or if the strong wind had wrung moisture from their eyes. What is it we witness? Why do they rejoice at a snowstorm? Asked Meave, pulling her hood over her head. Well, the blizzard's good cause to postpone their expedition by another day, Gabor responded. See, 
They've been conscripted by drawn lots to be settlers. Found homes in a village in Blackbrook Vale. Seven expeditions have gone that way already. And none survived longer than a year. Valley's cursed. No two ways about it. Intrigued, Meave proceeded to speak with the settlers' leader. He confirmed Gabor's claim. He had buried many a previous colonist. All had been abnormally thin, pale, prematurely greyed, as if some wraith had drawn the lifeblood out of them. Once the dwarf had finished his tale, he gripped the queen's hand firmly and, promising a generous reward, begged that she and her Lyrians accompany the expedition to Blackbrook Valley. Taint far! Mere few leagues north along the main road. We'll make the march much easier to came with the whole army, in case of any danger. I know not how useful our swords can be against curses and spectres, said Meave. But leave you bereft and in need I will not. We shall march with you into Blackbrook Vale and see to it that you are safely arrived. Then we will march on. The dwarf sped off to announce the good tidings to his settler brethren. By the time the blizzard had abated, they were ready to march. Be bold. Take on challenges, risks even. But before you set out to do anything, buy yourself some proper insurance. Always darkest, waiting's pain. Fall down, fall down seven times, get a bait. Then clobber that dunderhead and keep shoving it. Stay clear of Boros Rump, the Elder Kit. <sighs> Stay the Elder Kit, so we strip. Meave had stopped and was removing packed ice from her mare's fetlocks when Gabor Zigrin approached. The dwarf squatted at the queen's side, glanced about quickly, then started speaking in a barely audible whisper. Your Majesty, I overheard some folk talking in the smithy. Birdies claim there's treasure, true riches, in the hills near Blackbrook Vale, south of here. Stowed away there, and nobody dares go looking for it on account of beasts that have made their lairs there. You've got a wee army behind you. I reckon you can try. Might be worth the risk, eh? The queen brushed the snow from her knees and raising a hand against the glaring sunlight, peered towards the mountains. Though tempted, she had doubts. To start, the rocky scree at their feet warned clearly of avalanches. I shall think on it, she answered before vaulting into her saddle. Brook Vale holds many secrets and many treasures. Best cover your head in the mountains. Ooh, ha, ooh, ha, unforgive. Best cover, best cover your head in the mountains.
Impossible. I can't believe it. Gascon, he... He drank a dwarf under the table. I've said it before, I think, dear Reynard. You simply underestimate him. The following is proclaimed by formal decree of the Elder. From here on in, you're on your own, wench. What is this place? Blackbrook Vale. Quite lovely. Aye, and damned dangerous. Keep your arms at the ready. Blackbrook Vale. The name itself embodied infamy. Neve arrived expecting misty ravines, decrepit trees bound in spiders' webs and swarms of bats. What she saw was a warmly gurgling stream and the valley's gentle slopes blanketed in crocus blooms. Only a village of abandoned, ruined huts and a cemetery stretching to the horizon behind it attested to the valley's grim past. The village seems shrouded in a guise. Be not deceived, said the Queen. Reynard! Some men to search the environs for any sign of life. The blood-curdling roar that came from the ruins a moment later proved the Queen's caution warranted beyond any doubt. Following the victory, the settlers' hopes seemed renewed. Could the beasts they felled have killed the previous lot of colonists? Perhaps the curse that had long hung over Blackbrook Vale was at last broken. We thank you, Your Majesty, the settler's leader said, slipping the satchel from his shoulder. You have granted us new hope and a new home. The dwarves had rolled up their sleeves, were prepared to go at the huts to repair them, when one of their number cried out, Hold! There's something here. Something reeky. A voice most familiar, thought Neve. Yes for it belonged to Barnabas, the rescued inventor. 
the gnome had elbowed his way to the fore, stood on his toes, extended his nose, and inhaled through it like a pointing hound seeking out wildlife. Ignoring all queries, Barnabas had then sat down on the brook bank, filled a glass flask with water, and was now holding it up against the sunlight, dipping into it the tip of his tongue and some strange scraps of paper extracted from the depths of the pockets of his patched coat. Finally, Barnabas stood, brushed his backside clean, and announced his findings. Well, we know with some certainty the reason for the settlers' demise. Twere not beasts, no. They prowled in later, drawn by fresh graves. Twas the water. Oh, roll your eyes and whirl your fingers all you want, and then peer at the brook. Nary a fish, all poisoned by subterranean fumes. The dwarves hemmed, hoard, and grumbled, and were a heartbeat from abandoning the veil for good. Then Barnabas reached into his satchel and extracted a device of his own making he termed an aqua purificator. That is to say, a water cleaner, as odd as it may seem. You need but siphon water through this straw. Then drink up, worry-free. Thus Meave rode out of Blackbrook Vale deep satisfaction in her heart. The dwarves extolled her for being bold, shrewd, and wise while Gabor ensured this praise would likewise reach the meaty ears of Elder Hook. We're the dwarves of Mount Carbon. Hoo, hoo, ha! Hoo, hoo, ha! A two hammers is our sign, is our sign! We sp 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 spill me ale and get a pound and hoo, hoo, ha! Hoo. The rumours Gabor had overheard were true. Scouts returned with news of a cavern at whose mouth lay rotted logs, an indication that something of great weight may have been rolled inside. Chests full of gold, for instance. Then again, poor tracks clearly showed some beasts had made the cave their home. Right. Decision time. Enter, or scramble back down said Gascon, rubbing his hands together for warmth. Please, hurry. This frost is downright biting. We've scaled this high. Foolish we'd be to descend empty-handed. Fall in behind me! The queen took the four, sword in one hand, torch in the other. The flickering flame's glow illuminated the cave's interior, casting long shadows. Meave was certain some horror would leap at her at any moment. And she was not at all wrong. As soon as the last beast had fallen, the Lyrians took to seeking out the treasure. Soldiers dispersed throughout the caverns in a rush, penetrating every last corner. Finally, one called out. Got it! Got the treasure! Right here! Treasure! Shiny stuff! A number of steel-reinforced chests lay up against the cavern wall. Meave blew the dust from the lid of one and lifted it with some difficulty. She had hoped for gold and jewels, bars of Mahakam and steel at the least. Instead, she saw thousands of time-tarnished copper coins with a hole through their center. What's this bloody crap? Tokens of some sort? Uh, aye, that's right. Holy Goldens, we call them. They're, uh, currency in Mahakam. Get our wages in them. Use them to cop victuals and hooch. What of arms, armor, tools? Nah, oh, that's given to us. Clan provides it. Is that what you need? Weapons, or oh, feel the agent, uh, brought you here for no reason. Yet these tokens, they can be exchanged for other coin, can they not? To Merian Orans or Novigrad crowns? Aye, doable in theory, but not at all clever. Rates are crap, see? The Elders keep them low to make life difficult for Dwarven folk. 
discourage them from leaving Mahaku. What's this? Common dwarves use no gold? You cannot be serious. Yet I am. What good's gold to them? Clan gives them all they need, and victuals and hooch beyond need they get for tokens. Yet you trade with humans. Gold coin you take for your goods, the coin must serve a purpose. What is it? We hoard it all. In vaults. Great piles. Down bottom lie ducats dating from the reign of that dozy ham shanker King Dagrid. And you do not put it to use? Acquire anything for it? Then it's true what folks say, that you love gold too much to part with it. Hoard it for pleasure, as dragons do. Point of fact. That there's pure drivel. Gold's a metal like any other, just yellow. We hoard it for our safety. Your safety? I fear again, I simply don't follow. Couldn't it be simpler? Soon as human folk get it in their heads, we's a thorn in their side, we'll spend it. All of it, in a jiffy. Excess coin supply, that's called. Matter of days, gold will be worth less than sawdust. And you're tossing banks and economies, bam, on their arses. There'll be nothing left of them. They'll cave in faster than a mine shaft with rotten props. Why are you all ogling me? With human folk for neighbours, we dwarves got to be damn vigilant, as sheep round wolves. So how can these tokens serve me? We must trade them. Even should we get a pittance, it will be something. The soldiers demand their pay. Ah, your bums out the windy. Fighting men want full dixies and tankards a hooch. Coins but a means to that end. What do you suggest, then? As I've been saying, the tokens we use to purchase nourishment and meat, and what you've got in those chests, why, that'll do to fund a feast the likes of which Mahakam's not seen since Brewer was sworn in as Elder-in-Chief. The fighting men'll eat and drink their fill, carouse about and forget their due and pay right quick, and invite the local dwarves to feast with you, and the clans will look kinder on you, too. Caution be damned. Your Grace, I feel obliged to remind you we are at war with Nilfgaard, and every copper... Should go to building our army, I know. But we live but once, Reynard. Sir Gabor, take the tokens and arrange me a feast so grand that Epdahi himself shall hear us revel. As Meave's force could not possibly fit in a tavern, the feast was laid out in a storehouse. Crates arranged in rows served as tables and benches, while the windows were festooned with lion's foot and pasque flour. Great barrels of mead, cognac, and vodka were rolled in, and when the soldiers saw this, they broke out in cheers and laughter that lasted till dawn. Pour us another round, you lovable Lyrian bastards! <laughs> For he's a jolly good fair, uh, sorry, a jolly good dwarf. There was food and drink enough for the dwarves of the pass, who, with Meave's men, raised tankards in hand and voices in song the night through. To see them sharing tales and playing cards, one would not believe that anywhere down the mountains, through woods and across plains, humans and dwarves might, for the softest slight, leap at each other, murder in their eyes. Riding past a mine, Meave noticed a group of miners gathered around the entrance to a shaft. Frost had settled on their moustaches and beards, suggesting they had been there for some time. The Queen summoned Gabor and asked him to determine the reason for this sit-in. 
He returned after a few minutes and announced the most curious thing. They're waiting for the knocking to stop. Neve's frown prompted Gabor to explain in greater detail. According to our laws, dwarves can't go into a mine if there's knocking coming from inside. We're obliged to wait for the ruckus to quiet down. Ah, yes. Our own miners share this superstition, Reynard interjected. They say the knocking is that of a treasurer gnome, a kind of mine ghost. With all due respect, your miners are dimwits, Gabor said, patting Reynard on the shoulder. Knocking means an imminent and abrupt discharge of the potential pliable energy of rock formations. In other words, you can, a rock burst. Except usually it's all done in a day or two, whereas these lads have been waiting going on two weeks. Foreman's grown impatient. He'd like to send someone down the shaft, have him see what's at issue, but... Well, the code forbids us from doing anything of the sort. If in this manner I can gain favour among your brethren... Sighed the Queen, dismounting. So be it. I shall descend and see what the problem is. The shaft was too narrow to fit an entire army, so Meave and a small unit of men entered the mine, miners' lamps in hand and hearts in their mouths. The rhythmic knocking coming from the bowels of the mountains, distorted and multiplied, was unnerving. Soon the company arrived at the place that seemed the source of the knocking. Gabor put his ear to the rock and listened for several moments in silence, then struck the wall with all his might. The wall crumbled with a crash, opening a passage into another corridor, from which sprang numerous foes. Both sides were surprised. Both fought in the weak light of torches nearly down on hands and knees. In the end, the queen emerged victorious, and as soon as she had returned her sword to its sheath, she asked the new prisoners a question that was on everyone's mind. Who the devils are you? The captives looked at each other in disbelief, as if before them stood a ghost. Finally, one of them managed to choke out a response. Your Highness, we're... we're your subjects. Meave recognized the accent at once. The men came from Rivia. But what were they doing so far from home? According to the prisoner's account, after the Nilfgaardians' invasion of their kingdom, terrible poverty gripped the land. Seeking bread, some desperate inhabitants had gone to the mountains of Mahakam, engaging in wildcat mining in search of precious ores. Without asking the dwarves what they thought of this... You know yourself, my queen, explained one captured Riv. They guard their treasure real jealous-like, don't care a whit about the suffering of others. They see us starving down in valley and don't lift a stubby finger. Sadly, the Rivians had dug close to existing corridors. When Gabor destroyed the wall that stood between them and the dwarves, they were convinced they were being attacked by monsters, so they raised arms in self-defense. Meave, tis a tough nut to again, said Gabor. But let's nae kid ourselves. These men are thieves, and we must hand them over to the Mahakaman Guard. So they may do what? Sentence them to hard labor, or hang them at once, said Reynard his usual calm shaken and his voice raised. These are your subjects, Queen. They coveted their neighbor's goods, true, but only because they had knelt themselves. If dwarves left the mountains to rob the fields of Rivia, said the Queen after some consideration, I'd want to judge them according to our laws. Like it or not, Bruverhoek has the same right. But, lady, you're us Queen. You swore to protect us! From harm, yes. But not from due punishment. With a heavy heart, Meave handed the Rivs over to the Mahakaman Guard. What happened to them, I cannot say for certain. But they were not seen again. Well, boys. Well, bo well, boys. The sound of approaching hoofbeats made Meave turn to see Reynard spurring on his panting horse, galloping at a breakneck speed towards her. Ill tidings I bring, Your Grace. Clearly. Glad tidings never arrive with such urgency. Our scouts captured a Nilfgaardian messenger. He was traveling in disguise and by night. When he realized his capture was imminent, he strove to destroy the letters he carried. We were able to salvage some in parts. 
Anything of interest? Yes, there is, I fear. Your Majesty, you must listen. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. Hail Keritza. A traitor. We might have expected as much. Nilfgaard has shown amply that it abides only by the rules it sets. Since they have not proved able to defeat me in the field, in open battle, they seek other means. I suppose the scroll bears no name. It does not, Your Grace. The messenger. Have you questioned him? Naturally, Your Grace. Alas, he knows not to whom the letter is directed. He was to leave it in an agreed spot. I take it tidings of the whole affair have spread throughout the force? Yes, Your Majesty. The witnesses were too many to keep this fact a secret. We must thus assume the traitor in our ranks knows it as well, and will make no attempt to retrieve the scroll. A dead end. Have we any other leads or clues? None I fear, Your Majesty. We must be alert. Keep a keen eye on events as they unfold, and exercise great caution in forging new acquaintances. Very well. Eyes wide open, all senses attuned. Yours in particular, Reynard. Of course, my liege. Meave's force neared Davor's abyss. Signs of beastly feasting were not hard to find. Countless paw and claw tracks were impressed in the blood-stained snow. Among the boulders, bones picked clean were strewn about. Gascon lifted one from the ground. Empty inside, he said. Something sucked out the marrow. Meave's soldiers feigned indifference to the grisly sight. They marched on their stepped rhythm unwavering, a song on their lips. Yet hearing a slight tremolo in their voices, Meave knew they merely sought to drown out their fear. A moment later, a commander's horn sounded, the signal to halt. The queen galloped to the fore of the column and found herself at the edge of a vast, round hole in the ground. She could not see the bottom. Meave drew her reins tight to prevent her mount from taking even one step forward. What is this? A crater? A desiccated lake? A mine of the strip variety, Gabor explained. Treasures we picked and shoveled for here. Diamonds. Till we happened on the beasts, that is. What now? Orion's a dam. Holds back a lake. If we can break it, water will rush in, fill the abyss and the tunnels from which the beasts emerge. Just need to get around the mine first. Way down's on the other side. Meave squinted and gazed into the distance. Indeed, there was the dam. And at its foot, a swarm of beasts roiled about. Her soldiers gazed at their queen expectantly, their arms at the ready. She knew well they would rush into battle, in spite of their fear. Gabor! Meave cried out over the whirling wind. Have you bards here in Mahakam? Of course, Your Grace! Then we shall give them good reason to compose this day on the themes of courage, of heroism, of Lyria! 
Gee up! And with that cry, the queen spurred her mount, grabbed a banner, and raising it high over her head, rushed headlong at the horrid swarm. And indeed, bards sang of this battle soon after. For no claws or fangs could break through the wall of shields the Lyrians raised that day. And no scales could protect the beasts from the Lyrian stinging arrows and blades. Fight! Do not relent! Let us show these beasts! It is they who should fear us! The queen shouted. In the end, the beasts turned to flee, yet Meave's force cut off any chance of escape. A solid wall of men began to push the monsters ever closer to the edge of Davil's abyss. Pressed from all sides, the horrors began slipping over the precipice, screeching terribly as they fell. Silence came at last. The queen stood at the edge of the precipice, breathing heavily, leaning on her sword. From the depths of the mine came muted growls and groans. Let's flood the damn hole, hissed Gabor, before any other shite crawls out of it. A rush of icy water suddenly rose, then just as abruptly plunged into the mine, flooding the pit. And where once lay Davor's abyss, now lay Davor's pond. Meave descended back into the pass, exhausted and covered in beastly blood, yet also exceedingly pleased. She was one step closer to Dwarven support in the war against Nilfgaard. Once the Lyrians had put some distance between themselves and the now destroyed monster lair, Meave ordered her men to pitch camp. Then she sent the quartermaster off for food and drink. The soldiers lit campfires, then set aside their weapons. Soon after, lively music and song could be heard throughout the camp. Your Majesty. Reynard said from behind Meave's back. A messenger from the Elder-in-Chief. The Queen turned to see a dwarf in a richly adorned jerkin and a shako with golden seams. She stifled her laugh into a smile and lifted her chin proudly, expecting praise and a pledge of aid in the war against Nilfgaard. My lady, your daring deeds have come to the Elder's attention, said the dwarf in a measured voice. He's positively irate and demands an explanation. Irate? But why? I and my men, we've aided you greatly. Elder Hoog awaits at the Long Bridge. You'd be ways not to keep him there any length of time. And with that, all the Queen's enthusiasm for a celebration was instantly gone. She waited until the fires expired and the songs died down, then gave the order to march. Gazing towards the horizon, Meave noticed a dark shape outlined against the mantle of snow that lay on the ground. It proved a tower, toppled and broken in pieces. Around it lay the ruins of other buildings, blocks hewn out of basalt rock protruding from the permafrost. That'd be the Clan Vidmar ruins, said Gabor, hollering over the wind. Rich ones, had the clan seat here till earth tremors turned all into dust. Hundreds of dwarves lived here once, and now... Not a living soul. Ah! Uh, help! Save me! On the contrary, there was someone midst the ruins, and said someone was clearly in trouble. 
Neve ordered her men to find the unfortunate soul. They returned moments later, leading a dwarf whose teeth chattered. They had found him in a ruined building where he'd sought shelter from ghouls. Judging by his appearance, the dwarf had spent the better part of a week there. Marco Vidmar, they call me, he said, patting down unkempt hair that seemed to reach in all directions. I came here seeking a family heirloom, lost in the tremors and the chaos they caused. I ken the chamber where it ought to be, but, well, beasts made the lair there. I cannot drive them off on my own, but bold warriors like you ought to cut them down in a jiffy. So, will you help? I too have lost my home, estate, said the Queen, so I understand well what you feel. I shall help you recover your heirloom. Call it a whim. Mirko Vidmar's face lit up. Though he'd spent a week besieged and eating stale biscuits, and though there was a hoarfrost in his beard, he quickly trotted to the front of the column and led the Lyrian soldiers to the underground chamber. As soon as the fight was done, Mirko Vidmar ran towards a crate that stood on a pedestal, slipping on the now bloody floor. When the dwarf lifted the lid, precious stones spilled out. Your heirloom, this? Asked the queen, rather puzzled. I thought a pipe that belonged to your grandfather more likely. Seems to me Brother Mirko was not wholly candid with us. This here's no heirloom, no family souvenir. It's the treasure trove of Clan Vidmar. We thought it gone for good. Pressed for the truth, Mirko admitted no family sentiment had prompted this expedition. The dwarf had planned to leave Mahakam and start a new life among humans. Yet he did not wish to do so without sizable capital. I can't stand to stay here a moment longer. The days, all of them, they're identical. Rise with the first cockscrow, march in double file to the latrine, crap on command, twelve hours down the shaft and home to sleep. Mirko complained. One to wifey, put on an application, in triplicate. Care to snip your beard? Elders got to approve it. You wanna add buttermilk, not cream to your mushroom soup? Clan council's got to debate it. How's a dwarf not to get balmy? I understand the lad, no two ways about it, Gabor sighed. But I feel it's my duty to remind you that what Marco's going and doing here, well, there are laws. Treasure's due the Elder in Chief, not to Marco, that's one. Second, any dwarf that wants to leave Mahakam can't take nothing but his breeches, his dixie, and his coat. So, brief like, consider well afore you make your decision, Your Grace. I sympathize, Mirko, said Neve. But I'm a crowned head. I must decline. National interest requires I show the greatest possible care for my relations with Elder in Chief Hoog. Yet in aiding you, I could sour those greatly. I shall return the treasure to him. I must. While you do what you will. Mirko Vidmar swore under his breath, then jostled his way through the Lyrian infantry and into the mountains, towards human lands. Oh, only the banner moves, blown by the wind. Downright poetic. Prime material for a ballad. Perhaps even a whole saga. The Lyrians rode a narrow, winding path along the rocky ridge. To one side were ice-covered boulders, to the other, a chasm hundreds of feet deep. They could have at least erected some barriers, complained Gascon, knocking snow from his cap. Got plans for that, Gabor said. Just need to decide how high to make them. What? Think, shouldn't they be the height of your average dwarf or a human? The debate's gone on for 20 years. 
On the one hand, you've got... Gabor did not finish his discursion. He was interrupted by the Barbagazi that jumped down from the rocks. Archers, shoot! Aim for underbelly! Meave's soldiers made quick work of the lone monster. But the sound of battle spooked the horses harnessed to one of her wagons. Whoa there! Whoa, damn it! The driver tried to rein in the animals, but could not. They dragged him into the chasm along with his cart and the soldiers riding it. They landed a few dozen feet below on a rocky outcropping. A moment later, Barbagazis swarmed everywhere. Did you see how they fared? Anyone left alive? Asked me, leaning over the cliff edge. Worry more about their cargo. Gascon replied. They were also carrying chests of gold. Blast. We can't get down there. Too steep and the snow keeps falling. We can lower ourselves down a line. But without armor, shields, or heavy weapons. Otherwise it will snap. And the Barbagazis? The queen said, brow raised. We shan't kill them with daggers. They're too thick of armor. We'll have to try. Or continue on our way. You only live once. Meave sighed. Gascon, round up some volunteers and let us move out. Moments later, the Queen was lowering herself down a line straight towards the gaping maw of a Barbagazi. Her only armor, a woolen shirt. Bereft of sword and shield, Meave could not withstand a single blow. She thus danced atop the frozen snow, deftly dodging the Barbagazi's lightning-fast strikes, while delivering but a few well-aimed hits of her own to their eyes, ears, and gaping jaws. When the last monster fell lifeless to the ground, Meave walked up to the shattered wagon. The soldiers it had carried were bruised, frostbitten, but alive. Your Grace, we were sure you'd leave us. A good ruler never abandons her folk. Nor her gold, Gascon interjected while securing a rope to a chest. Soon enough, all were safely back on the path. The admiration Meave saw in her soldiers' eyes was in itself sufficient reward for her difficult battle. Fresh snow today. Welcome to me inn. We've many folk today, but there's always room enough for more.
We've now witnessed a sorry sight. A mass funeral for miners killed due to a tragic convergence of events. Their lead caskets lay upon the snow, wreaths of hop cones laid upon them in turn. The mourners waited for the diggers to finish. The digging was tough, for the ground was frozen. As the crunch and thud of picks and shovels continued, the dead miners' foreman scrambled onto a boulder to make a speech. Angry shouts and loud booing stopped him. You knew it! You knew they'd smell vapors, but you ordered them to keep digging till it blew up in their faces! Make the daily quota whatever the cost, eh? You blood on your mitts, whore son! A mourner then picked up a chunk of frozen ground and threw it at the foreman. Blood spurted from the gash that appeared on his forehead. The first dirt chunk was followed by another, then by a rock, a brick. Meave realized that if she did not intervene, the foreman stood to be stoned to death. Something had to be done quickly. Meave saw this clearly. She spurred her mount and rode into the cemetery, pushing through the throng, then stopping before the foreman, the horse shielding him from further blows. Calm yourselves! Silence! His guilt cannot be decided here. It must! Before Meave could finish her plea, a large rock thrown from the crowd struck her bosom, nearly knocking her from her saddle. Upon seeing this, her Lyrian escort lowered spears and drew swords and rushed at the angry mourners. Kino Kren! Isbel cried out. Her hands began to radiate a fierce light that blinded both dwarves and Lyrians alike. Have you lost your minds, all of you together? Not had your fill of misfortune yet? Lower your arms at once. Whether the power of Isbel's magic or the force of her appeal had the greater effect is difficult to say for certain. Either way, both sides suddenly lost the desire to fight. Me breathed a sigh of relief, aware that if not for Isbel's intervention, a great amount of blood would have been spilled at that cemetery. Knew there'd be a stink cause of this. Knew there'd be... Knew... The Lyrians ascended the highest section of the Mahakam range. Snow crunched under their boots, cold air stung their lungs, and the wind snapped at their cloaks. <sighs> Meave wiped sweat from her brow and turned to Raynard. There, by the rocks, we shall... The rest of her words were drowned out by a powerful blast. The entire mountain rumbled with a low, vibrating roar. The sound grew louder, echoing off the rocks, splitting their ears. The Lyrians looked around, disoriented. Few heard Gabor's warning. Did I just stand there? Get behind that rock! Quick! Hurry! Me followed the dwarf's gaze and cried out in terror. The snow stuck to the mountainside had started to slide down the slope, sending up mists of icy dust. Before she could react, the white torrent knocked her to her knees, crushing her and smothering her into the ground. All she felt after that was all-encompassing cold and fear. Meave survived. The dwarves who ran to the Lyrian's rescue dug her out of the snow in time. Some of her soldiers were not so lucky. The queen looked at their bodies, blue, frozen. Next to them lay dead horses, demolished wagons. The losses were enormous. Meave wiped her cheek. Her tears burned her frozen skin. Gabor spoke a while with the leader of the Mahakam Guard Patrol that had come to their rescue. His face was dour. What? What have you learned? Uh, I'll tell you all in good time. First, you need a warm drink, good victuals. No, Gabor. I need to find out what in blazes happened here. Well, it was an avalanche. Of course it was an avalanche. I'm no fool. 
But what caused it? What was that noise? Um, <clears throat> signal horns. Ours. So you brought this snow down on us, dwarves. Well, I, but uh, unawares. Explain in brief. See, we clean our mount regularly. The 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 way men folk shovel snow off their roofs. Otherwise, the whole shebang come tumbling down in our heads. When snow's gathered deep enough, we blast our horns to cause a controlled avalanche. Then we need to but sweep up a wee bit and the road's safe. All well and good, but why did you decide to clean up right as I was passing through? I'm wondering that myself. Schedule says next cleaning should have been a week from now, but someone has the route to be cleared earlier. Who? Me, but I'll tell you. But first, promise you'll... Who? Hey. Ovin Ip Klenvok, the Nilfgaardian emissary. Must have found out you'd be going through. The bastard. Reynard! Reynard! Wait! Wait! I understand you're a wee bit upset, you've every right. But you'll never prove Ovin meant you harm. The sly weasel makes sure he'd done it dirty his own paws. I've no such scruples. I'll find him and kill him. And then? How'd you tell that tale to Bruva? Meave, you're justly taught, but for the love, just this once, let it go. Or you'll leave Mahakam with near a scrap to show for it. Moments later, scouts reported Ovain was camped to the north of the accident site. Meave had to decide how much she was willing to risk to get her revenge on the Imperial Emissary. By the Elder Sideburns, up. Nilfka, what a mess. I'm so sorry. There, my lady, whispered one of the scouts. Left of the path. Meave squinted. The Nilfgaardians had taken shelter from the falling snow under a rocky outcropping. The smell of roasting meat wafted from their campfire, and echoes of laughter could be heard. The black-clad soldiers had reason to celebrate. They had just decimated Meave's company without even drawing their weapons. Meave's gaze caught something else. A metal container into which the Nilfgaardians tossed bones once they'd been gnawed clean. It looked strangely familiar. Only after a moment did the Queen understand it was an overturned Lyrian helmet dug out of the snowy grave of one of her men. The Horsons! Meave hissed. They'll pay for this. Meave! Asking your last time to keep a cool heat! Whispered Gabor. You want vengeance? I get it. But think of the cost. If so much as a hair gets plucked from Ovain's head, Bruver will never forgive you. And you can kiss any hope of aid goodbye. Silence followed. Finally to be broken by one of the scouts. Milady, what's the order? Do we attack? No, said the Queen after long deliberation. But Milady, they... I know what they did, and that I shall never forget nor forgive, said Meave, placing a hand on her scout's shoulder. But breaking Dwarven law only plays into the North Guardian's hand, causing us to lose allies and our chance for victory. Meave brushed the snow from her trousers and straightened her spine. Avenge our comrades we shall. Not here, but in the fields of Lyria and Rivia. The Lyrians resumed their march with heavy, beleaguered steps. Their path still piled high with the snow brought down by the Nilf Guardians. While passing the mining settlement of Kolstok, Meave heard the sounds of battle. Hey ho! Into the fray, lads! Expecting she would see monsters swarming dwarves, the queen set off at a gallop to the rescue. Her braid blew about in the wind like a banner, showing her men in which direction to attack. The dwarves she saw, however, were not engaged in a battle against Shailmars and Barbigazis. No, they were going at one another. Luckily, no weapons had yet been drawn, 
but given the dwarves have hands the size of bread loaves, this did not necessarily mean there would be no deaths. Oi, lads! roared Gabor Zigrin. What's this foolishness? Calm the hell down, damn it! Gabor's intervention proved successful. The dwarves limited themselves to verbal jousting. Meave, who was no stranger to barrack room talk, nonetheless turned crimson at the dwarves' cursing. Piecing together the obscenities, Meave concluded they were debating an old quarrel about the height of a certain mountain, or rather of the twin peaks atop it. One of them lay in the territory of Clan Dahlberg, while the other in the Hoog's land. Each family felt their peak was the highest, all measurements indicating the contrary being total fabrications. Queen! started Gabor, nervously chewing his moustache. They're asking if you... As yin impartial and a fair-minded wench to boot, wouldn't he wish to settle their idiot squabble once and for all? Meave knew well that this type of age-old quarrel could easily end in bloodshed, so she resolved to help. Representatives of the two clans gave her a strange mechanism she was to use to measure elevation. All that was left was for the Queen to button her coat up to the neck and scale the Twin Peaks. Time to end this delicate feud, once and for all. When she and her force had travelled half the way to the first, she heard a long roar that made snow shells detach and descend. Without waiting for her scouts to return with reports, Meave drew her sword. The Lyrians managed to repel the monsters and reach both peaks. Upon each, Meave ordered her men to take the measurements. While waiting, she admired the breathtaking view of the Mahakaman Massif. The dwarven contraption left no room for doubt. The peak within the Dahlberg clan territory was two feet higher than that within Hoog territory. Gabor was clearly displeased with the results. Damn it all! I'd hope you'd prove Bruver's clan was in the right. He'd have been content to see the Dahlbergs knocked down a peg or two, and possibly he'd have been more inclined to help you, said the dwarf in frustration. Then, after a pause, he added, Although, only you saw what the device showed, Queen. Perhaps you could, uh, recalibrate the results a wee bit? Tis most lowly and ignoble, Ake cried out in protest. A knight his honour would never stain with such a lie. To lie would be simple, true, said Meave. Yet to forget the matter would be so much harder. No, Gabor, I shall tell the truth. The Queen's tone made it clear the discussion was over. Gabor let the matter lie and Meave's force began its descent down the mountainside. The dwarves of both clans had been waiting with bated breath for the expedition's return and report. As soon as Meave announced the results, the Dahlbergs rolled barrels of beer out into the square and began to celebrate. Naturally, the Hoogs were disappointed, yet they accepted Meave's results as final. At last, they had come to trust her. Dahlbergs are the dwarves we need! Every Hoog's a dirty For first bite, you'd best avail yourself of some onion juice. Even better if you had a wee nip of vodka. Look, one's... As Meave neared Langbridge, she ordered her bugler to announce her arrival, then retired to her tent to freshen up. Gascon was already inside, awaiting her. I do not seem to recall summoning you. In that case, I must tell you to fret not. Nothing wrong with your memory. I've come with no agenda. Spontaneously, call it, to chat. Hmm. Then I propose you leave, just as spontaneously call it. I must don fresh clothes. I'm to see the Elder soon, and I'd prefer to not smell of horse sweat. Doubt it'd make much difference to him. And be assured, I know what I speak of. 
when last we met, I found myself standing downwind of him. A pungent experience. Well, Hugh was saved the experience of his breath. So pungent, I thought I might faint. Well, to revive you, pinch you awake, I'm sure would be quite a pleasure. Gascon, I beg your pardon. Ugh, I shall have nightmares now. Not tonight, for I fear you might not sleep at all. You see, there's something you ought to know, and decidedly before you meet with Bruva. The sights we cleared of beasts, I ferreted a bit. Noted something peculiar. Any notion what it was? None. The monumental dwarven architecture, perhaps? Bones, my dear Meave. Dwarven bones. Now, guess what I found on them? Wait, don't dare give me any hints. Bite marks. Of course. After all, they'd been gnawed clean of all flesh by monsters. Incidentally, making it quite easy to spot other markings. Ones made by axes and swords. To be certain, I showed the bones to our medics, and they confirmed my conclusion. Meaning what? That the entire clan, the Fuchses, did not perish due to an invasion of beasts from the depths. The monsters merely ate the bodies and occupied empty homes. Now, I shared my discovery with Gabor, and guess what he did? He panicked. He started to squirm, babble nonsense. I wager my right arm, he's hiding something. Blast. Overly eager to aid us from the start he was. I might have sent something. I shall have him summoned at once. And I thank you, Gascon. I won't forget this. Minutes later, Gabor stood before the Queen. At first, he tried to mislead her with evasive answers, but as her pointed questions demolished one clumsy excuse after another, he had to give in. Oi. Has King Desmond said after a hefty squirt in his hose, we can't sweep this under the rug? If you think I welcome jests in this moment, you err. My fingers itch to summon the hangman. Right. So. Tis true. I misled you. On our clan elders' orders, supposed to make sure you destroyed Boris Rump and Davos Abyss thoroughly enough to leave near trace. What? Why? What did they wish to hide? They was home to the Fuchses, our mortal enemies. They'd been a boil in our hineys for ages, thumbing their noses, taking what they want when they want, and the elder in chief didn't give a plowing wit. So to stop them, our clan, we did the unpardonable. The Zigrin elders saw their chance and they... Gods. So you were responsible for the deaths of all those dwarfs? Me? I, I, I didn't raise a finger. Tried to stop them, in fact. No witnesses survived. Meaning you must have murdered the entire clan. How? Queen. You sure you... I am. And you should be sure to answer in full, omitting no detail. A few years back, we got pummeled by a horrendous winter. Stone-breaking frosts, white-out storms, avalanches. We'd travel in a painful form of suicide. Hunger drove beasts out of their dens. Pass was covered in the filth. Got to where they paced right outside the walls. Fuchses fought a hard, bloody fight to keep the critters out of Davos' abyss. Lost near every axe-wielding dwarf they had. Only survivors had to winter at Burr's Rump. Our elders felt such an opportunity wouldn't knock again. After killing the town's meagre guard, they... They set fire to it and barricaded the gates. They didn't stand a chance. Bastards. How in the world did the truth go undiscovered? Once it were over, our dwarves opened the gates. Before they'd let their pipes, starving beasts came crawling out of the pass. The stank of dead flesh were strong. Zigrins who came back from that never were the same. If you'd only gandered their gaze when they had us all take a vow of silence. And then, 
You invented that blarney about primeval monstrosities the Fuchses had awoken by mining too deep. A riveting tale, and one with a moral to boot. Aye. But the Elders worried Bruver would suspect something all the same. That's why they wanted you to destroy all the evidence. Repugnant. You claim not to have taken part, but neither did you do anything to stop the massacre. What was I to do, exactly? The Elders had decided. They had Dwarf would listen to me. You might have informed the Elder-in-Chief. The guilty would have been punished. The guilty? You didn't have Ken Bruva. He'd punish the whole clan. Women, children, no exceptions. Meave, Queen, I'm begging you. He cannot ever learn of this. Aye, I want to hack flame too when I think what the Elder's done. But other way it'd bring but more pain and death. I need to consider what's right. Meanwhile, Gascon, make sure Gabor remains our guest. Of course. I'll let you know if he so much as rolls his eyes towards an escape route. Bruva stood by the bridge like a statue, arms crossed, eyes squinting. Meave sighed inside. She stood little chance of having a pleasant chat. Elder-in-chief, sir. No Saren and Grayson here, lass. Plowing humans. Always out to fix things, always end up cocking them up. You think you're due glory, do you? Monster slayer Meave? Patroness of dwarves? Blast it. What do you think? Why didn't I exterminate those beasts myself, eh? Go on, tell me! For you. For I didn't want to. For something didn't affect, damn it. So I resolved to not destroy their nests and evidence till I learned the truth of who done it. Postponed it all those years expressly. Though your subjects were dying. I didn't need no lectures from the likes of you. Justice must be served. That's worth any price. And I was close. Had leads. And now it's all gone to hell. You flooded the Vore's abyss. You brought Poro's rump down on itself. And I'll never ken who killed the Fuchses. Understand? Never! My sincere apologies. I did not know. Course you didn't, Schumanns. First they cock it up, then they ask how it works. Ah. Most eager to give that braid of yours a yank and kick you out beyond the gate. But I canna, for the clans are grateful to you. Fools, fools, all fools. They've forced me to give you an audience, official like, with witnesses, all at the foot of Mount Carbon. Come on then, time to move on. But I'm going to ring you out so hard you'll wish you never left that Nerf Guardian dungeon. Bruver set off at a brisk pace, cursing under his breath. The Queen took a deep breath, counted to five in her head, and set off after him. <laughs> oh, flesh! <laughs> Wanted to hunt monsters, eh? Dwarves demonstrate innovative thinking in many domains. Metallurgy, engineering, architecture. Yet there is one in which they could not be bothered. Naming. For this reason, the bridge that linked the Mahakam Pass with Mount Carbon was simply named Langbridge. Meave learned it was a thoroughly fitting name. Having stopped for a breath halfway across the road suspended over a deep chasm, the Queen could see neither end of the bridge, both concealed by thick clouds. Amazing, whispered the Queen. I feel as though we traversed the very sky. The Queen and her retinue were nearing Mount Carbon when Meave heard a cry. It was Xavier. Hold! Hold! Meave drew in her reins abruptly. Her mare neighed and reared, lifting the Queen above her formation of men. From that height, she saw the last pier of the bridge crumbling. 
The dwarves at the head of the procession were unable to stop in time and plummeted, screaming into the abyss. What's the meaning of this, goddammit? Bruva roared. Face the engineers! No! The queen was striving to calm her spooked mount when she sent something swish past her ear. Out of nowhere, a Scoia'tael band had appeared at the rear of the column. Before anyone could react, elven archers had felled the rear guard. The soldiers lay on the bridge's stone surface with arrows in their backs. Meave was trapped. In one direction lay the chasm, in the other, a fierce foe. She had no choice but to stand and fight. Their strength combined, the Lyrians and Dwarves managed to defeat the Scoia'tael. The guerrillas had weakened the last span of the bridge, turning the crossing into a deadly trap. Had Xavier, who noticed the weakened structure at the last instant, not called out, all would have fallen into the chasm. The Lyrians managed to capture the unit commander. She stood, her head raised high, and when Meave glared at her, she did not avert her eyes. What is your name, Elf? Abayat me one. She said, uh... Thank you, Reynard. I know well what she said. Kiss my ass. Is that truly the best you can muster? I'd rather show you exactly what I can muster. Tell them to unbind me. You got your opportunity. On the battlefield. Will you not tell me what they call you? Fine. It's all the same to me. I'm more interested to know how you came to be here. Who sent you? No one. It was my decision to kill you, and thus avenge Eldane. Do you remember him? The elf whom you denied a burial? Whom you left in an open field to rot? You've elven blood on your hands. The blood of the elves of the Mulderwood. I regret the events of the Mulderwood. I did not wish those elves' deaths. Yet they left me no choice. What choice would you give a murderer who invaded your home? You know I envy you. To see the world solely as black or white, it must simplify things so. Enough. I've heard all I wish to hear. But I haven't. Did you fall in your heed, Elf, eh? If you want to fight humans, go on and do it. You cannot talk sense to Egypt's and nay here, damn it. Mahakam is and will be neutral. You cannot be neutral. To Dwan, you are either their foe or their dog. Mahakam has stood aside sleeping long enough. That is why we struck it in its very heart. As a call to battle. A call to brethren whom you, Elder, have kept from the world too long. I have kept him away. I've been bloody right to do so. You want to play at war, you numpties? You want to force the Pontar to flow upstream? Gang right ahead! Good riddance, I say. Go and kill, go and die if you fancy. But God damn it, leave us alone. Yeah, I should kill you with my own hands. I should cut your throat, put you out of your misery. That's what you want, isn't it? To die? To die a stupid death? Well, I'll not grant you that. Nay, nay, I'll lock you in a tower. Sit there three centuries. And you just might grow a brain! Bruva Hoog gazed after the shackled elf as she was led away. Neve expected him to continue fuming, cursing her. But the dwarf stood silent. And his old eyes, half concealed by brows bushy as a forest floor, showed not anger, but the deepest sadness. Dwarven engineers made quick work of repairing the crumbled bridge span. Look, Mount Carbon. Damn, and I thought Novograd was big. So the elves are against us, against our elder. Truth be told, um, so the yeah. truth be. The Lyrians stepped inside Mount Carbon's bowels. Meave rode while looking upwards, admiring the intricately carved ceiling, 
gilded walls, monumental bas reliefs carved from basalt. Yet this was no time to admire the sights. Ruva Hoog had summoned her to speak. I thank you for your invitation, Elder. My invitation? Choice term, lass. You wangled your way in here. Long I've lived, but ne'er have I seen a wench so stubborn. With all due respect, do you not feel like a pot conversing with a kettle? Ha! <laughs> True enough. Changes of mind didn't come easy to me. But they do come at times. Human wars concern me not at all. For so many they are, who could count them? Yeah, a year goes by without one wanking king invading another's realm. A dog with scabies is less restless. That's why this morning I aim to send you off with nothing. Matter not what the clans were saying. Rivia, Schmivia, who gives a sheep's fart? But that was this morn, before that daft wench and her pups attacked. Nilfgaard supports the Scoyatel, it's common knowledge. Nilfgaard uses them. Well, I'm nae worse, and I choose to use Queen Meave. So what use would you make of me, if I might ask? You've a plan? Aye, the kind dwarves like best. Simple, but sneaky. Like to give Nilfgaard a warning, you can. If you're going to rile my dwarves, throw them into the Scoyatel ranks. You'll regret it, aye? But I'd like to issue the warning without declaring war. All clear to you so far. So. When you march out of Mahakam, you'll find a company of our foot dwarves waiting out with the gate. Officially, volunteers enlisting with you against my will. And you're to put them at the fore next time you face Nilfgaard. Want the black lads to break their teeth on our bucklers, get a taste of our axe blades. After that, dare say they'll think twice before they send more Scoyatel into these hells. I'd... Do not... Thank you, Elder. You restore my hope that I shall have my home back in the end. Faith can move mountains, aye, but it cannot do much about borders. I've watched you close, and must admit you're a plucky lass. That enough for Nilfgaard? Can I be sure? We will see. We shall know soon. I would like to march at once. So by your leave? Nay, <laughs> not granted. At once? What does that mean? Our laws are clear. Guests are to be sent off with a thundering feast. Even the humans. Bruva, as was Bruva's wont, insisted. So the Queen accepted the invitation, but as was her wont, set a condition. The feast was to last but one night and not as was the wont of local custom, an entire week. Meave was on her way back to her company when who should step in front of her if not Gabble? To what do I owe this pleasure? Do the Zigrins wish to use me once more? Accomplish aught else with my aid? Could be, but if so, take none of my concern. Hmm. Why is that? For I've resolved to leave Mahakam for all time. Hmm. And where will you go? Then I can. Wherever you lead me. I beg your pardon? Your Grace. Meave. I betrayed your trust. Tricked you outright. In spite of that, you kept my confidence. Risking everything. To say I'm grateful is just a, a wee understatement. I'm indebted to you. Deeply so. Please let me pay it off. Let me fight at your side. Heed to help me. Gabor, vindictive I am not. Oh, thank you, Meath. Yet neither am I stupid. You may join our ranks, I agree. Yet trick me once more, in the tiniest manner, and I shall show you no mercy. Is that clear? Chastened, Gabor merely nodded to confirm. Meath extended her hand for the dwarf to kiss as a sign of submission. Yet he simply wrapped his arms around her waist and squeezed. 
When the sun had retired behind the peaks, the underground city came alive with the sound of bugles, bagpipes and horns. The dwarves emerged out into the central square and danced exuberantly, sparks kicking up from their hobnail boots. The usually crabby elder-in-chief Hoog proved a cordial host that evening. Let's drink! Lest our neck shafts grow cobwebs! Suddenly a messenger arrived. Bruver lifted his copper horn to his ear and listened with furrowed brow. What's that? Speak up! When she saw a sour grin on his face, Meave knew the tidings were not good. Yet she did not suspect they pertained to her directly. Meave, you expecting anyone? How's that? Runner says a delegation's arrived at Carbon, Freluria and Rivia. Got a Nilfgaardian escort. How dare they? Traitors. Who leads it? Uh, you'd best sit. Who leads the delegation? It's your son. Willem, I fear. Willem? Markham remains neutral as regards all your squabbles. I trust I needn't remind you. So I'll have no scrambling nor shoving, and certainly no bloodshed. Point of fact, I'd prefer it if you... I wish to speak to him. I'd forbid you, but, as I said, never seen a more stubborn wench. All righty then, jabber away with him. Just remember, hands to yourself. Meave spotted banners, a Lyrian eagle upon one surrounded by Nilfgaard's black rags. Her hands became fists, showing how helpless she felt. Then her son and rival, Willem, emerged from behind a row of Imperial footmen. My, my. I should apologize. It seems I missed the coronation. Congratulations, my son. Who was it who placed the crown? General Epdahi? Count Caldwell. Ah, yes. Our elder statesman. Why have you come here, of all places? To acquire arms for Nilfgaard? As my official mission, yes. Yet unofficially, I wish to speak with you. I trust you've had tidings from the field. Edern turned to ash and dust. Vizimir murdered Redania in chaos. Faltus forced to strike a pact by his vassals betrayed. Hensult the same. This limerick, will it come to a point? Why, yes, to the same as this war. Mother, I beg you, you must see it. N Nilfgaard's victory is inevitable. Surrender now and I shall show you mercy. For later, later it'll be too late. There will be no later. We shall repel them, drive them south at the points of our pikes. This we, mother, who precisely do you mean? You stand alone. I prefer to stand alone over standing with Nilfgaard, with the invader, as you do. Mother, <laughs> In declaring for the Empire, I saved the lives of thousands of our subjects. And in so doing, our honor lost. Folk who had their huts burned down care deeply about our honor. Is that truly your belief? When I was crowned, a fact you deride, though that makes it no less true, I swore the good of my subjects would guide me. And a war we are doomed to lose cannot in any way benefit them. And slavery can. You know well the Blacklads put peasants in chains, like cattle. Reprehensible, I agree, but... And resettlement? Forced labour? Cruel laws that make death the punishment for the slightest offences? Are those benefits? Well, answer me! I see I will not swear you, Mother. A shame, though I take comfort in the fact I tried. And now, it's you. Oh, no. I, not you, will decide when this conversation is over. Oh, have we anything else to discuss? Are you perhaps aware that the North Guardians tried to kill me? What? No, I... I, I heard only about an avalanche. Which tumbled down through no small effort of an Imperial envoy. Never would I have agreed to such a heinous act. I believe you. I'm heartened that, despite all we... I believe you, because I believe the North Guardians wouldn't ever have asked your opinion. Think on it, son. Are you their ally or their tool? Can you ever be sure? I am the King of Lyria and Rivia. To serve my subjects' best interests, 
I am prepared to make even the most painful concessions. Might I leave now? Or is there more? Naturally. How did you know you would find me here? I... I received Nilfgaardian reports to the effect that you've been seen in the past. Oh, roses are red and so are your cheeks, my son. As ever when you're caught in a lie. Lyria is two weeks' travel hence. Had you received word only once I was here, we'd have been long gone from Mahakam by the time you assembled a force and completed the march. No. You were forewarned of our intended route. It means I've a traitor in my ranks. Another one. Get out of my sight, Billy. And pray we only ever face one another on neutral ground. Meave struggled inside not to turn and gaze once more at her son. He'd changed since they'd last faced each other, grown manlier, and he wore the crown well. The Queen returned to the banquet hall. Her advisers shot her questioning glances, curious what she had discussed with Bruva. But Meave decided to keep the details to herself. One of them wore a Nilfgaardian lead around his neck. Until she knew who, she would have to remain vigilant. Feasting's done, Reynard. We must consider our next move. I've thought on it, Your Grace. We've strength enough to hit the foe, but still not the numbers to face him in open battle. So what do you pro- This war we cannot win alone, nor even with the dwarves at our side. But if we secure a victory, small yet symbolic, we shall show the other realms of the North all is not yet lost. Thus, I propose we attack behind the front lines, somewhere well clear of any major Imperial force. Where would you suggest? I'm considering Angren. To begin with, a thickly wooded marshy land, always helpful in clandestine operations. Secondly, the land strategically important, as it's the chief source of building material for Nilfgaard's fleets. All too little, I fear. Since we require a victory that would be symbolic, we must strike where it shall hurt, and Angren... Just recently welcomed a new regent, in the person of Count Coldwell, my third argument. Naturally, if your majesty wishes, I'm prepared to present alternatives to this. No need. We march at dawn. Meave had toiled, cajoled, persuaded, and gained the Dwarves' support. She left Mahakam strengthened, markedly. Even so, the Queen was in a foul mood. For it was clear a traitor, a viper, nested among the Lyrians. Someone who had conveyed the Queen's plans to her foe. From this moment on, Meave would need to weigh every word she uttered, even in the presence of her closest associates. Your Grace, we must plot our course forward. Shall we take the Western Passage into Angren, or...? Not now. When, then? Dawn approaches, yet we know nothing of where... I will not repeat myself. The Queen knew she would learn the traitor's identity in the end. If need be, she would tear the name from the throat of another turncoat, Count Caldwell. Meave drooled at the prospect of seeing Caldwell in chains, then passing him to the hangman. Saddle the horses. I shall take the fall. The time for diplomacy, for preparations and negotiations had gone. Meave was to attack her foe at last, and she could not wait to do so. At long last, Meave's force reached Angren's marshy woods. Ever been? No. Count yourselves lucky. Are you certain we haven't lost our way? Alas, here there is no way. We continue south, that's all. South meaning the bottom. Should you ever venture there, I offer you this advice. Do your utmost. To make no noise. Poor soul. His comrades cried out, reached out. But alas, amidst frothing waters, they heard bones cracking, the moan of metal bent and crushed. What the? 
Bloody hell, what was that? Rather not know, personally. Hold your positions. Arms at the ready. It was a glusty war. One of many the Lyrians would encounter along their path. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. At last, Meave and her force stood upon the Yaruga's bank. To find and punish the traitor Caldwell, they would have to cross the river. Yet the sole bridge nearby was in Nilfgaard's hands. Your Majesty, some new reports require your attention. And we will continue this in the next episode, so if you liked this one give it a like, dislike if you think it sucked, and see you next time. Thank you.